Thank you very much. You are here for our final talk of the day. And the topic we chose is a combination of two things that are very important at the moment. The first of all, technology is something that brings us all together here. And on the other hand, you all are aware of the many discussions ongoing about this topic, sustainability. And we wanted to follow this Zeitgeist, and we found a speaker who will bring both topics together for us. And his talk, A Vision for Digital Sustainability, is going to do just that. Please welcome on stage Max. Yeah, hello everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I, am, I get to do this kind of talks a lot about sustainability and tech. Um, I have a background as a software engineer myself. I used to build websites as well, so you can later also ask me very technical questions. Uh, but this one is really um, more the narrative about sustainability. Um, when I started doing these presentations was about four years ago when we founded our nonprofit. And I always had to start with a slide. Because back then, the word sustainability was not, it was not so clear to people what it means. Then for a while, I didn't have to do this slide, and now I have to do it again, because now sustainability is literally glued on everything. Like, you go into the supermarket, there's sustainable yogurt, sustainable apples, sustainable cars, sustainable television, sustainable speakers. And people have forgotten that sustainability at the core is a balance between uh, the needs of society, the needs of the environment, and also economic needs. But that actually was never the point, especially in relation to climate change. The point was to figure out sustainable development. And what is sustainable development? It's a way for us as a society to move forward, to make money, to develop, to have children, in a way that it doesn't hurt the planet for the next generation. That's what sustainability, when you remember maybe these SDGs, everybody all of a sudden had them on their website. The whole point was how, how do we develop as a society in a sustainable way? It was not about how do we make sustainable chairs as quickly as possible or sustainable websites. It was about figuring out that question. And with the SDA, and for me always I say the whole IT community, it's the same question. You, we need to figure out how do we digitalize more, right? How do we add more software, make more applications, make more websites in a way that does not hurt the environment and it does not, so to say, um, have a negative impact in the future? And that's very hard, right? Always a good example is if we, if we add a new website or we, we build a new large-scale application, we need 10 new servers. Those 10 new servers definitely have an environmental impact. Um, so we. I would say we are still at the very beginning of figuring out what does it mean to have a sustainable digitalization or digital sustainability, whichever way you want to put it. Now, where do we start? Um, one of my favorite quotes from Lord Kelvin, um, who made the Kelvin measure, to measure is to know. So the first thing we have to figure out is how do we measure the environmental impact, especially for now the environmental side um, of the digital world. And in order to explain you how that could work in principle, um, I, need to, I will take you a little bit on my own IT journey because it's a bit funnier and it's a bit more interesting that way. Um, good old days. When I started working in IT, most of my work looked like this. There was an application somewhere that I built um, with a few users that I kind of knew. Um, and I installed that application on a server in a data center. Most of the time, I actually even knew where the data center was, who the data center was owned by. I maybe even sometimes bought the server myself, so I knew what was the hardware. And I kind of figured out how to set up my own networks and things like this. That, that was where it all started. And then, I'm sure you can relate, every two to three, three years, we added another layer. Um, the first one was this one, virtualization. All of a sudden, 10 servers look like one. Then came the next thing that's probably the thing that most people are excited about right now, which is containerization, which is can we package the application in a different way, lighter VMs. And then the best thing in IT, in my opinion, is uh, serverless. It's quite ironic because it still runs on a server, 
but it's serverless. Um, but of course, functions and slicing applications into even smaller pieces. Each of these layers is another layer of software. We, can't, we can never forget. It's, it's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of software. And then we did something even more crazy, because IT is always abstraction, more abstraction, right? We did it like this. So we tried to even forget about the data center. So we created something that I'm sure you all know, which is called cloud infrastructure. And it's always good to remember that even if you look at an AWS availability zone, an availability zone is not a data center. Under an availability zone can be three, four different data centers, and you won't even notice, nor will you know, nor do you know where they are. Right? It's the complete abstraction um, of what I call digital resources, or you could call them cloud primitives. Um, it's compute, memory, storage, and network capacity completely abstracted away. Now, if you look at that picture, and I ask you, how do you measure the environmental impact of a software application that's running on this? I'm sure you understand that that's not so simple, because each of these layers does not necessarily reveal the environmental information that you need. Good example, in a virtualized environment, it's very hard to get the energy from the underlying server, for example. In the cloud, not even you have no clue what's going on. Um, so what we did at the SDA, and I'm not allowed to build software anymore, so now I make models. <laughs> um, so. We made a very simple model, and I, explained, I will explain to you why this is important. First of all, it's important so that people who are not from tech understand how this works, but um, it's also important to have this simplified view to make measuring a lot easier. And in this model, there's a simple component called digital infrastructure that produces resources. I call them digital resources. I'll explain to you in a sec. Then there's another layer which is cloud hosting, whatever you want to look at, whatever you want to uh, call it, um, that is responsible for taking those resources that are produced and allocating them to an application or selling them to you. Um, and then we have the application that's using the resources to provide a service or experience or whatever um, to a user. Now, this works in the context of cloud. It works in the context of server-based applications. But it also works if you look at a phone. A phone is digital infrastructure. It produces resources. There is iOS or Android on it that allocates those resources to an application. And you might use the Berlin City uh, B4G app um, of, the, of the public transport, and that's the application that's using the resources of your phone. This model works in any context. And it makes it very easy for non-technical people to also understand the flow of things without being very technical. The key in this is the idea that there is something called digital resource. There's a lot of books that call it cloud primitives, but ultimately what you need to realize, especially when you talk to environmental scientists, they will always say the same thing. Software cannot have an environmental impact because software does not physically exist. Right? That's true. Software does not consume energy. Software doesn't consume aluminum. Software doesn't consume, doesn't produce CO2. Because software consumes compute, memory, storage, and network bandwidth or capacity. And that's generated by a computer. And the computer is an analog to digital converter. It uses energy to generate these resources that software can use. And when you realize this, then you can also imagine how easy it is to take these resources that the computer makes and associate the energy effort as well as the environmental impact to each resource it generates. So very practically, if you have a laptop and it has 16 gigs of memory, and the laptop had a ton of CO2 in it when it was produced through the manufacturing process, then you can just divide these 1,000 tons by 16 gigs of memory. So each gig of memory um, owns this much CO2 of the laptop. And that's really important. Because a lot of people are trying to measure the energy use of software, and that's very difficult. What, you need to, what we all measure already, if you look at IT monitoring systems, are these four primitives. We all know how much CPU cycles, how much memory, how much storage is being used by an application. And all I need is a way to then say, one gigabyte of memory that I'm using in my application has this much environmental impact. And for that, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. This already exists. You can do a life cycle assessment of each resource. 
Um, or you can get there even mathematically. If you're interested in that, it's on our website, and I can explain it to you. You, you can convert compute memory storage into environmental impact, like CO2, uh, if you want it very simple, uh, purely mathematically, because computers are quite uh, predictable in the way how they use energy to produce um, digital resources. Now, sorry, lots of uh, abstraction. <laughs> This idea of digital resources enables some other interesting things. Um, the, the top part, like I said, I think everybody in IT that I know already measures this for most applications. How, many, how much memory, how much storage is being used for the application. But the second part is something, for example, that most cloud providers or hosting companies are not very transparent with, is how much waste is there. And I think a lot of you here build websites. If you if you think about most websites today, you have servers running all day long, waiting for a visitor to come by, right? So there's an enormous amount of idling computation laying around, and that's something that we definitely need to fix. I can, uh, an interesting number from VMware is they estimate that the average utilization rate of servers around the world is about 15%. That means 75% of all computation on this planet right now is essentially unused but still consuming energy, yeah? <laughs> so there is, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but we have very little transparency on the utilization rates. That's why it's hard um, to look at that. Now, from the technical side to the responsibility side, which is my favorite thing. So just because you can measure something doesn't make it sustainable, clear. But the first step to sustainable development of a sector is for all of the actors in that sector to take up responsibilities, right? If I'm a user, and I, I will use good examples, I think that makes this a bit easier. If, I, if, I, if you buy an electric car, great. You sh still shouldn't drive it in a circle, right? So you as a user have a responsibility to, to use products in a sustainable way uh, and not, uh, not waste them, not buy products that have functionalities that you don't actually need. And the same is true for software. If I make software or digital products, I have a very important responsibility. It is my job to make sure that my application uses as little digital resources as humanly possible. Right? It's the same if I manufacture a car. Back in the days when they still uh, made gasoline cars, primarily it was the job of the car manufacturer to reduce the amount of gasoline being used to drive 100 kilometers. That was regulated, was heavily pressured. Lower, 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 lower. The second thing, again, car industry is a good example, is software manufacturers, anybody who makes software, websites, doesn't really matter, uh, needs to give the user transparency of the resource usage from the usage of the user. What I mean by this is, if you, again, if you go in an electric car these days, you press the gas pedal really hard and you're an aggressive driver, there's usually a display that it immediately says, the way you are driving uses a lot more of the battery right now, right? So there's an immediate feedback between I do something, and it uses more resources, and I have complete transparency on how the car is using those resources based on my behavior. How, do, how does that translate into software? For example, if I make an export, I don't know, or I generate a report in my ERP system or in my CRM, and that involves, I don't know, doing a database query for 100,000 records, right? And the user just has to wait five seconds, and somehow in the background, 10 machines are starting up to do this anal analysis, then most users don't realize, for, for all of you it's obvious, but most users don't realize the, the resource usage that is connected to their behavior, right? They don't know that they're currently spending 1,000 kilowatt hours per day just on generating a report that they never look at, because there's no transparency. And of course, the last one is if you buy digital resources, so if you buy a VM at DigitalOcean, you should force them or at least ask them if they can show you that that resource was sustainably made. That's something you should demand. I'll give you an example who does that already. Um, the other responsibility is not so interesting maybe for you, but very important for me, is that hosting companies or any provider or seller of digital resources is responsible for making sure that utilization rate is optimized so that we don't have so much waste uh, in our systems. And at the end of the day, if I'm a server manufacturer, a data center owner, um, or a cloud provider that is vertically integrated, 
then it's my job to produce sustainable resources that other people can use. Now, I'll be quick on this one. Not so interesting. We are a nonprofit, right? So we work on basically developing tools, policies. We're doing lobby. We lobby a lot um, to make these things a reality. So to, to basically put these responsibilities into law, or to give people um, the ability to yeah, to be transparent voluntarily. But ultimately, we we have learned that a lot of this stuff will not happen if there is not uh, if there is not law. Um, a good example at the very bottom on making sustainable digital resources. Um, there is an energy efficiency directive from the European Union that is currently being passed, which will include for the first time that all data centers in Europe have to make their energy consumption transparent. Also the cloud providers, completely transparent, uh, reported to the European Union, um, and also made public to all of us. And that's quite the game changer, because so far no data center has ever released their power consumption. Um, on, on how much power they're actually using, uh, not their installed capacity. Um, so there is a lot of laws and, and legal frameworks already coming. Um, maybe interesting for you on the digital product side, if you look really closely at the taxonomy, actually, if you, if you make a digital product these days that's sustainable and you can prove and you can show the environmental footprint of that product, you can actually claim in the European Union um, that it's a sustainable investment and you can get a lot of money for a lower cost if your product can show its environmental footprint. That's in the taxonomy for sustainable investments. Um, last one on the more philosophical side. Um, I'm German, obviously, but I live in the Netherlands. And I, when I read German newspapers and when I read about, like, Germany defining what the digital space should look like, but in Europe now in general as well. It's a lot about security, safety, privacy, sovereignty. It's fear, right? It's like the Americans are taking something. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. We need to, you know, strike back. We need to bring everything back home. And I don't really think that that's the contribution that we ought to be making uh, to the digital world. I can understand that we as Europe want to make the digital world a bit more um, the way we had imagined it. But I think we should remember that the values here on the right side, right? Um, that's what Europe stands for. That's literally copy-paste from the European Union's website. These are European values. And I think bringing those values into the internet and into the digital world um, is a lot more interesting than uh, making these cookie banners, right? Um, so I think we ought to think about how, how can we, as, as Europe, bring this to this, global, um, to this global place that is the Internet. Just food for thought. <laughs> um, now, since you're all a bit technical, more nerdy, uh, which I don't normally have, uh, I brought you some examples, because it's always easier to talk sometimes a bit in examples. First example, what can you do to make software like really specifically more um, sustainable. Um, it's an example I tried to make before. It's linking the environmental impact to the usage of a user. Like I said, if you are generating a report, make it visible to the user how much energy and how much server capacity, how much environmental impact is associated with that action, especially if it's a heavy lifting thing. Um, because people don't know. For all of us, it's super obvious, but for most people, it's not. They just they use an app, they use a website, they don't, if it's slow, they think it's the internet. Sometimes things are slow because they use a lot of resources, but they don't make that connection. So making that transparent really helps people understand and adjust their usage of digital products. Right now, the assumption of most customers is that everything that's digital is basically free. And it has like infinite resources and storage is infinite and there's nothing attached to that. Um, and of course, all of the digital stuff is designed to make you exactly feel that way. You never actually see the underlying infrastructure. The second thing, a very simple one, I think, when you make a feature or a, a ticket or you want to develop something, constrain the environmental cost of it. Right? So if you make a piece of software that has a specific function, say it should not use more than 100 kilowatt hours per month in energy. Just put a constraint there. 
every developer loves a good constraint, right? Like, has to work in Internet Explorer 6. Great constraint. Um, here's another one, environmental impact. Limit it. Make, it. make a box around it and see if you, can, um, if you can develop software within that constraint. Would be very helpful for my job. Another thing, a really silly thing, and this is, by the way, from one of the largest Dutch banks. They actually do this, ABN Emro. Um, classify applications. Brilliant example. My mom has a WordPress site, of course, with cooking recipes, right? And I, I did a bit of digging, like, where is this WordPress site running? And it's running at a hosting company that is using tier four data centers. Tier four data centers are basically the same as banks are using, right? So everything is triple redundant. Triple redundant. Yeah? So my mom's cooking blog is running on like bank grade infrastructure. Why? Right? Downtime of that blog is completely insignificant to society or any function. And think about how many, like if you use DigitalOcean or the cloud, tier three, tier four data centers, all your applications are running on multi redundant diesel generator backed up stuff. Do we really need that for all the applications? And do all the applications need to run all the time? Right? Um, and this classification, if we would make that transparent and, and standardize that a bit, I think it would help a lot of hosting companies basically offer like low redundancy, like we have for storage in a lot of cases, storage with less redundancy, storage with more redundancy. And I think the same has to be true for compute, that we classify it a little bit more. Like, again, my mom's WordPress blog definitely doesn't need to run on tier three, tier four infrastructure. Last one. Um, avoid waste. Um, this chart you probably know from your laptop or any server that you run. Like most of the time, compute looks like this. So there's, everything is designed for peak capacity, same in the energy sector. We need to figure out how to solve that. That's one of the biggest, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems. We keep buying more servers. We keep producing, manufacturing more and more and more. And it's like, if I would tell you, hey, we're building a new power plant in the center of Berlin with 300 megawatts, and we're going to use like 3,000 tons of coal every day, you would ask a question, what about all the other power plants? Are they fully utilized? Do we really need to build another one? We never ask that question in tech. Right? We just more resources, more, 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 more. We need more servers. The cloud needs to be infinitely scalable. When I press a button, a new server must appear. And that comes with an enormous environmental impact. There is unfortunately not a lot of transparency, but to give you an example, one server from HP, just manufacturing, has about 15 to 30 tons of CO2 embedded. Right? It was manufactured all over the world. It was shipped all over the world. Um, the components, there's the entire periodic table of chemicals and rare earths and minerals is inside a server. All of you, I think you know. And we should be really careful when we deploy more hardware. That's a, that's a very important thing. Sorry. I get very emotional about this. <laughs> and this is the last one. Sorry. That's a really simple one. That's something you can take home. Just do it. Wherever you're hosting, Wherever you're using IT resources or, or infrastructure, send them an email. Say, like, man, I need your environmental footprint report. I need to know for each VM how much energy, how much CO2. If you need a list of all the, it's a lot more water use, ADP. It's all on our website. Um, just ask them. Just ask them for it. Please, just send them an email. I need more transparency from you. Um, and really, yeah. That's my only ask to you. Really just ask them, because right now we have zero transparency. A good example of this, they actually made the contracts open source. Salesforce has this clause that they put in all their supplier agreements now that basically says either you report your carbon emissions and you show us a plan how to reduce it, or we will charge you a penalty of like 100,000 euros. So it's really important to drive, especially from the top, so all of you are building applications on top of the infrastructure, is to drive demand for transparency and responsibility into the stack. Yeah? Because the cloud providers right now, they're not doing a lot. They're doing a lot of marketing, but not a lot of actual action. That's it. Thank you very much, Max, for this presentation. And I already have a couple of questions from the audience. <laughs> okay. 
So let, let's start with this one. What do you think of cloud footprints offered, for example, by Google Cloud Platform, assigning emissions to the resources an account uses? Are they accurate? Are they well-defined? That's a, that's a whole presentation in itself. Um, OK, I'll, I'll give you my commentary on the big three. We start with A, AWS, shit reporting. Completely ignores scope three. So it basically says um, they don't have any hardware because the scope three is zero. So they don't account for hardware or data centers or anything. They just look at energy. And they account for energy in a way that's a fraud. You have a windmill in Iceland or hydropower plant in Iceland. And they basically say, we are consuming that energy in Italy. I show you the cables. There's no cable connecting Iceland to Italy. Yeah? So that's very, very, let's say it's called marginal accounting of energy. It's not good. So AWS, bad. Microsoft, mm, better. They're very honest about their scope three. So when if you look at their reporting, they say actually scope three is growing very, very quick because they're buying so many new servers. So they're very honest about that. But they don't really include it in their reporting tools. In, in our opinion, and most of the time, only looking backwards. Google is the most advanced, um, always, because they have access to a lot of uh, really good data. Um, but I still would caution, because the way Google accounts for the energy, again, allows this Iceland phenomenon to happen. And that's not actually helping anybody. And ultimately, you always have to keep in mind, their business model is of selling you more resources. The best customer of Google is one who forgot to turn off 100 VMs, because it's literally printing money and the servers are idling. Yeah? So they have no incentive to give you any information that would make you turn things off. Yeah? Just keep that in mind. It, they always make it sound like they're saving the world. They are in the business of selling you resources. They are like an energy company. If you have three fridges and you leave them with the door open, so they are running 100% and the utility is like, yes, guys, keep on doing this. Whatever you're doing, consume more. And you always have to keep that in mind when you're looking at these reports. Yeah? Thank you very much. The next question. Many hosters are advertising renewable energy certificates. And with the Green Web Foundation, I'm able to check that. Yeah. Is my web application then sustainable enough if I take care to reduce compute power? Good question. So first of all, we are good friends at the Green Web Foundation. Shout out to Chris Adams. We love the little badge. On the certificates themselves, that's not enough. I mean, you can read about just Google GOOs, guarantees of origin. Norway is selling three times the green electricity they actually produce in certificates to Germany. So everything here runs on Norwegian hydropower. And physics doesn't work like that. Elect electrons don't travel like that. Yeah? So this is mostly greenwashing. Um, second thing that I really want you to know is a lot of people talk about energy because it's something that is very tangible in IT. But I tell you, we've done a lot of research and we have a lot of numbers that the impact from the hardware itself, from just buying new servers, is as high as running them for five years on green energy. Yeah? So both problems are relevant. And the energy problem, no offense, is not the job of IT to solve. The energy grid will decarbonize, and then we have green energy everywhere. The job of IT is to reduce the numbers of servers that are being used and turning off applications and things like this. So building on that question uh, regarding our job as developers, uh, here's a rather long question. So someone's saying it's not that difficult to tell people how much energy a search query or streaming uh, video consumed. But would people's behavior actually change? Because the question is, um, on the one hand side, integrating all these information into the software costs money. Mm -hmm. And people want to use fewer resources, right? The companies want to use fewer resources. So we have to spend more to create more transparency to use less? Yes. It's, that's a very, it's, it's, it's very philosophical, but I think the, the, simp the first, the simple answer is economics. Economic theory has shown that any form of transparency leads to behavior change. Example, cars. 
the fact that you can see how much how many how many liters of gas a car consumes per 100 kilometers if you're constrained financially you will change your behavior you will buy a different car you will drive differently especially if the gas price goes up so having this i don't really have the perfect answer to this i'm just saying that we we ought to find out right let's let's make this information available to users and see if they change their behavior because today they have no other choice than to just there is no information so we cannot we cannot really test it we cannot verify if or if not they will change in all other industries more transparency leads to behavior change look at organic food since it existed now you see a lot of people even though organic food is not actually better but it's still a lot of societies now moving towards that okay thank you working further on that topic if I have to calculate resources and waste for servers and infrastructure in an ESG report, mm. I, I think I have to, that's what it says here, um, is it not necessary to calculate used labor to create this software, which would equal the resources, and the overhead for users in the software usage, which would be waste? I don't it's know if I understand this difficult question. One, yeah. I, so, but I, I would try to answer it maybe in a more generic sense. If, if I do an ESG report, um, first of all, today you usually take financial numbers, you multiply them by emission factors, and boom, you have an ESG report. Um, the, what should go in there is the footprint of your entire digital or IT real estate, servers, data centers, electrical equipment. Um, it has nothing to do with people. People don't go on an ESG report. They're not resources. Um, and then you have servers, you have laptops in your company, right? You have network equipment, cables, all this. That goes into the ESG report. The effort of people to make that report and things like this are not part of that, and never. Um, it's, so to say, it's ignored. It's really just about phys physical um, pieces. OK. I think there's a question here which aims for the thing you mentioned that the software itself is it's a digital thing it's not it's, it's virtual it's the hardware that's actually consuming uh, energy and resources and the question is how are inefficient algorithms measured in a cloud scenario if software is not responsible it's like uh, the yeah it's like opening the windows in the winter and the heating is turned on if w i have bad software yeah actually so so a lot of people in the lower parts of the stack, so digital infrastructure and research, they always point at software people. They're always like, it's software that's so inefficient. We are doing everything perfectly. We're running the world's most efficient data centers, but software people just are not as good as we are, and they create to totally inefficient software. Um, I don't think that's really true. I think, though, it is a communications problem. Why? Because if you really think about it, data center cooling systems, most of them could be turned off half of the day because the servers are idling, but the data center doesn't know that because the server doesn't, the, the server doesn't expose that information to the layer below. And if you go upwards, operating systems, virtualization software, each of them tries to optimize each other. If you ever look at install the VMware cluster, you will see that they basically say, turn off all the energy optimization features of the server because VMware does it better. Right? So each of these layers is like trying to make the job of the other person. The compiler tries to make the code better. Right? And at some point, it, we have to stop trying to always just optimize each other, but just rather each layer should just focus on their responsibility, if that makes sense. But right now, it's a lot of like, pfft, like the operating system will fix this for me, the browser will fix this for me. It's just, let's just agree what I do and what you do and talk about it really quick, and then we, we settle there. Um, because that also creates a lot of inefficiency. I think VMware adds about 30% overhead to an entire server estate, right? And that's layer by layer by layer. It always adds more inefficiency. And the final question I have for you, after all the hardware and software, <laughs> um, is going to 
sustainability is often reduced to the environment or CO2, but there's also, as you showed on one of your earlier slides, social sustainability. Does your association, the SDIA, um, focus on open source, for example, on social sustainability? Yeah, we, we do. I, I think the, the challenge is why we often don't talk about it is because we don't have any models to measure so to say, the social impact. We already have very little models to measure the environmental impact of software. To measure the social impact of the digital world is even harder to measure. We, we work with some of the best universities in the world, best social scientists, and they make these like, surveys with 480 questions. And it's too, like, it still doesn't capture, like you say, in, in the, it was like, oh, open source. Okay, but open source is not software. Open source is a governance model. It's like open source should rather be compared to democracy. That would be more, a more useful comparison. And the, the social part is very important to me, but to be honest, today, we don't have any models to talk about it, to measure it. And we often then drift really quickly into this TikTok is bad thing, right? Because that's bad for children. And that is very reductionist, right? That's also not correct. But because there is no framework to really talk about it, you can very quickly get to this like finger pointing, like, this is bad for children, this is bad for my head, this is bad for this. And that, that's not useful. And then until there is this framework to have a useful conversation, I think we at least focus more on the environmental side. Um, because at least there is facts that we can talk about, not just anecdotal opinions. Max, thank you very much for these insights. And I think we as developers have a lot to think about, how to not use resources that are just idling, but <laughs> to re reduce the resources we actually need and, and provision. So thank you very much for your talk. And you in the audience, please remember to rate Max's talk in the app so that we can award the best speaker award at the end of the conference. Thank you.